Hey, I'm Mike Davidson and welcome back to the Long Range Pursuit. We've got a great show for you this week. A good friend of ours and a good customer of ours, Bruce Jardine, was able to get his hands on a Pavant elk tag in Utah. We're going to go there again with Travis Murphy and Western Lands Outfitters and see if Bruce can get his hands on a big bull. Travis Murphy and Western Lands Hunting Company. A good friend of ours, Bruce Jardine, got a hold of one of these Pavon elk tags. Uh, Bruce has come to our shooting school a couple of times. He's got a couple of our rifles. And it sounds like he's been practicing quite a bit, huh? Yeah, we've, got, uh, we've had a few times, a few opportunities to shoot. And been shooting in at 13, 1288 to, to uh, 1,000 yards. Feel pretty good there. Well, if he's been practicing at 1,000 yards and we get a seven, 800 yard shot, we should be good. Yeah, we hopeful. <laughs> Bruce says it's pretty unreal and I, I agree with him. I've never been in elk like this before. bulls over 350 this morning from the first place we stop. It's not what we're looking for. We're going to go find another vantage point, get up high, do some more glassing. We've got to remember this, you don't see 350 bulls here, so we'll keep looking. A rifle trigger has several main components. The trigger housing, the trigger, the sear, the adjustment screws and springs, and a safety mechanism. The component pieces must be manufactured and assembled precisely to ensure the best possible rifle accuracy. A simple jig and hydraulic press is used to press fit the two side plates and adjustment blocks together using oversized pins. Once assembled, this component group is called the trigger housing. Before final assembly, the technician will lay out the necessary components and tools at his workstation. The first step is to install the trigger in the trigger housing using another oversized pen. The trigger adjustments for weight of pull, over travel, and sear engagement are installed in the trigger housing. The sear interfaces with the engagement surface of the trigger and the interface must be carefully adjusted. The technician uses an action to test fit the sear and make the initial settings for over travel, weight of pull, and sear engagement. Finally, a safety mechanism is installed to check for proper function. After all the assembly and function checks are completed, the trigger mechanism is verified on a trigger scan that analyzes the force and movement of the trigger. A trigger capable of long-range accuracy will have a specific profile and shape on the force travel chart. This trigger is ready for installation.
machine's overheated, so we decided to come hunt real close to where it was, let it cool off for a little ways. We come in down off of the top of the mountain here. There's a spring just just uh, behind us, but the, we walked right in on a pretty good bull down here. We just got a glimpse of one side of him. He looked pretty good, and then he kind of went behind some brush. So we're trying to pick him out now and see if we can't find him. I mean, these guys, thirds and fronts are just, you know, just, just mediocre. Yeah. yeah. That's what sets it back, I think. Just having the little front, shorter front end. Well, there, there we went, man. Well, we went over the ridge. <laughs> nice 370. Not quite the bull. Not carrying a lot of mass at the top, but uh, really a nice bull. It's pretty cool. Okay, this was Friday see. afternoon. We'd be shooting. <laughs> A ballistic turret is calibrated in the yards to your target. On today's topic, we're going to discuss what you need to do to accomplish a shot that is beyond your turret calibration. Uh, essentially, when you adjust your elevation adjustment, you're changing the angle relationship between your line of sight, which is your crosshairs, and your bore line. Essentially, uh, when you dial that elevation adjustment, you're lifting your bore line so you can shoot a target that's farther. Uh, on the new ballistic turret from G7, we've added an MOA calibration. So now you have your BDC numbers, which is your range to target, your wind hold calibration, and now the MOA adjustment. That allows us to make MOA compensations. Almost all scopes have the MOA adjustments. Usually we're calibrated for a quarter minute of angle, so that's a quarter inch at 100 yards. Uh, generally, with more expensive scopes, that calibration is more accurate. Now, we've got a calibration on our scope. We need to know how much adjustment we need to make for a certain range. I've got a target set up out here and it's 1175 yards so I need to know how many minutes of angle or how much I need to raise that bore so that I can hit that target at that range. Now one way to do it is uh, go to g7.com use the free online ballistics calculator. You're going to put your ballistic parameters in like your BC of your bullet, your muzzle velocity, uh, we'll also have some simple sighting conditions like your zero range, your sight height, etc. Uh, you'll also program in your anticipated elevation and temperature at the time that you're going to shoot. Uh, those are pretty straightforward things to collect and enter. And then we're going to calculate a drop chart. We want the output to be in minutes of angle. And it'll tell us for 1175 yards we need so many minutes of angle adjustment. Today I'm going to use the field version of our G7 ballistic calculator. And I've already got my uh, ballistic parameters stored. This is my rifle that I'm using. That's a 65284. BC 612, muzzle velocity is about 3020. All I need to do is program in my line of sight to target. It's 1175. And then calculate that firing solution. It tells me 27.8 minutes of angle. Now, we have 20 minutes of, of compensation per revolution. So I'm going to go up all the way one turn so that's 20 minutes and now I need to dial to 7.8 which is seven and, and three clicks so seven and three quarters now that's my drop compensation this also tells me that for a 10 mile an hour wind I've got six minutes of angle so I need to get a dope on on what my wind speeds do and I'm running up to 10 13 miles per hour there but my crosswind amount is running right in that seven to ten miles per hour so I'm going to shoot for in that four to six we'll try five right off the bat and see if I can hit that target in five minutes
Well, that was six minutes of wind. The wind picked up a little bit while we were shooting. The tricky thing was timing the swing of the target so that by the time the bullet hit there, the target was turned and facing us. But we got it there, six minutes of wind. We had 27.8 minutes of angle dialed into our scope. That's a tough compensation, but with the right equipment and the ability to dial the proper compensation amount, we can make those kind of shots. I'm Aaron Davidson, and that is shooting ultra long range. Shooter bull spotted. We're gonna. We set up on him here, but he's just a little too far. He's about 1120. We'll see if we can't get down the hill about another two or three hundred yards, get a little better shot. But uh, no wind, so that's good. No smoke, so let's get. Let's move down on him. Seven seventy five. Seven seventy five, This real good bull. Um, we just watched him come coming through the trees. He finally came out into a clearing, and we hustled down the hill here, got set up on him, and you know, right before uh, right before we could get a shot off, he just he dove right into the trees and didn't give Bruce a good shot. Hi folks, Ed Rocknowski here for Long Range Pursuit. T today's tech tip is going to be one of the things that I think is overlooked most of the time and when a rifle is cleaned, one of the things that are overlooked is the extractor and the ejector plunger. One of the little tricks that I have found out that works for me is I take the bolt and I clamp it in some sort of a vise at an angle and I put the ejector plunger at the bottom. What I do then is I take a little bit of carburetor cleaner and I squirt and let it kind of lay right down there in the path and I let it soak down into the ejection plunger chamber. And what that does is it kind of softens up the crud and everything because after a number of rounds through this weapon, you'll find there'll be microscopic particles of brass that will start to go in there and it will inhibit the ejector plunger from working freely. After that, you let that set for a while, what you do is you take some device, whether it be a screwdriver, and you work that up and down to make sure it's free and as you work it up and down give it another shot of carburetor cleaner and you'll find if you look real close there'll be some bubbles come out and what that is is we've got some fluid down here and we're causing a hydraulic action and as we push the ejector plunger down it's forcing the fluid out and with the fluid comes some of the foreign material that we're trying to get out of there 
Now, once you do that and you get that good and free, I take the bolt out of the vise, tap it, and I usually let it set for four or five minutes to let everything drain out of there. Once that's all drained out, I reinsert it into the vise the same way, but this time I take some lubricant. I put a couple of drops of oil on it, and I fill that trough down in the bottom there. I let it set for a minute, and then again, taking a small device, I work the ejector plunger up and down, and again, you'll see some bubbles come out, and what I'm doing is I'm allowing enough oil to get down in there, but in the same token, when I push that down, up and down a number of times, you'll find that the hydraulic action will push most of the oil and any other foreign material out of there and at the same time be lubricating it. This is one of the things that's very much overlooked. Now, if you have a Sacco type extractor in a bolt face, you can do the same thing on the plunger over on it, on the other side. This one here does not have a Sacco type extractor, but it has a plunger in it. You can do the same thing there. Again, I take the bolt, I stand it up and let the excess drain out of it and you're ready to rock and roll. I'm Ed Rocknowski and that's your long range tip of the week. When shooting at long range, shot placement is critical for satisfactory terminal performance. With a VLD style bullet, an impact in the high shoulder area will penetrate the shoulder, then expand and damage the spine and the lungs. This will anchor the animal in its tracks. Choosing the high shoulder shot placement will also increase hit probability. There is more error allowed left and right for wind and vertical placement ensures there are no low misses. Just driving down the road, we spotted one of those big bulls that we're looking for. He's right up on the hill. Got Bruce and Tucker. We're gonna, we're gonna climb straight up and get him. He's big. lightning going across the road there. He's huge. Um, we've worked our way up this road. Got a 250 yard shot at him. Looks good. Let go. Bruce put some lead in him. Solid hit. Just crashing the top of the hill. See if we can find him. It's about a 250 yard shot. Off some sticks. Excited. Breathing hard. Should be right up here. <laughs> Six days of hunting. Bruce stuck with it. We all stuck with it. Uh, we've had some hard days and some disappointments. Seen a lot of bulls. Done a lot of walking. And for something like this to come together at the last minute with a bunch of good guys, it doesn't get any better than that. World class bull for a world class guy. <laughs> By far the best awesome. bull we've seen. By far. By far the best bull. That's what you look for, right? <laughs> The thing that makes him the best is he's laying there. Yeah, yeah right there, man. <laughs> it's a trophy, huh? Right yeah. there. Uh, it's been a great hunt. This is, uh, this is a bull of a lifetime for me, and it, it will be uh, a hunt of a lifetime. It's not, doesn't get any better than to have good guys from Western lands and a gun works gun that uh, will take anything down at any range if you've got a good shooter behind it. 